You want to give it a few more minutes, Mark? Yeah, and, and Tori, do you have a presentation or are you just going to talk about the topics? Um, I have an outline covering the, talk, the topics we talked about me covering about. I don't have an actual video presentation or anything like that. Okay. Somebody, somebody's giving feedback. I think I don't know. Yeah, I'm I, I'm I'm watching. I'm monitoring it. Um, okay. If you know, if if you can, if you know how, mute yourself. Uh, if we start getting feedback, I can tell who's uh, who, where it's coming from, and I can you know mute appropriately. Where's the fat man tonight? Which fat man's that? Mike Fatsy. Oh, dealing with some life oh. stuff, you know, life oh, yeah. in the way sometimes. Family stuff. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Life gets in the way, as we all know, right? Yeah. So, so when I do this tonight, I want to. I, I like to be very interactive when I'm when I'm talking to people. So I want to encourage people to ask me questions and interrupt me, and then then we can have a longer Q and A at the end, like we talked about, if you want. But so. That's a good idea. And then um, I'll, I'll monitor the chat window as well. So if you know how to, you know, put a chat in there, if you want to um, raise a question or you can even, there's also ways to raise your hands. Um, I don't know if you all know how to do that. So um, right um, down at the bottom of the screen, you'll see a little smiley face and you can, you can, you know, raise it, raise your hand or thumbs up or whatever. I'll, and if, you, if I don't, if I don't see it, then you can shout out say, Hey, <laughs> but if we get everybody talking at once right now we have 19 people on if we get everybody talking at once it could get a little crazy well i welcome interruptions and questions i like to be okay. interactive you know okay so um here comes brooklyn so um you want to say a few things first Neil, um, we could probably, we had 20, 21 people on and um, it is 7.03, you know, you can either start or we can get it a couple more minutes. 60 seconds, that's it, the clock <laughs> starts, so they get right. what they get. <laughs> if they don't join by then, they miss my fabulous speech. <laughs> But it's recorded, right? So it is you can watch it right over now. and over and over again. So Arctic Chevrolet. I'm like, I'm like, there can't be anything down here. For the woolly bugger on, and boom. Robert's iPhone. Is that Robert's <laughs> iPhone? <laughs> it was. It was. <laughs> All right, Neil. Let's, let's okay, get folks. Started. Yeah, why don't we get started? Well, uh, folks, thank you for joining tonight. Hope everybody's doing well. Um, I just want to make a couple announcements. Um, so, uh -huh. up and coming speakers for our chapter, uh, April uh, Cole Baldino is going to give a talk on the Pacific Northwest, the status of the uh, steelhead and salmon, and the work that he's doing to try to rally to save those things. Uh, the numbers over the years have totally been, you know, decimated. So he's going to try to give us a talk on that and also give us ideas on how we can support from the East Coast. Um, in May, we have Phil uh, Sheffield from, I think a lot of folks know him from the Connecticut Catch and Release Fly Fishing uh, Facebook site. And then, you know, he does a lot of fishing in Rhode Island. So he's going to give us a talk on, you know, targeting striped bass in the spring, early summer. And he's also gonna talk about conservation, uh, what we can do to get involved. Um, a few of our fundraisers are you know, happening. So we have a you know, Make Life Sweet uh, fundraiser. You go to our chapter webpage, it's there. It's, uh, we're partnering with a, a local company, uh, Maplecraft Foods. Um, all sales, they give us 30%. So it's, it's, a, great, it's a great win for us. Um, they have a great product, so check them out. Also, uh, May 21st, uh, put that on your calendar. That's going to be our uh, 
we're calling it a beer wine bourbon tasting event. We're going to have silent auctions and uh, live auctions. Uh, it's going to be over at Dickinson Park, Newtown. Uh, so we have the pavilion uh, reserved. More details to follow. But May 21st is going to be that event. Um, also, um, I just want to uh, make an announcement. On March 25th, 6th, and 7th, the Connecticut Fishing Outdoor Show is going to be going on at Mohegan Sun. <clears throat> And the Connecticut Council is going to be there. Connecticut Trout Unlimited Council is going to be there. And they're asking for volunteers. If you, if you volunteer for four hours, you get in for free. Um, if anybody is interested in, in, you know, sitting at that booth for any of those days, uh, just reach out to Mike Fatsy. Um, and that's all I got. So tonight we have a speaker. Uh, I think a lot of you possibly know him. You go up to uh, upcountry sport fishing. Uh, Tori Collins, um, great shop. It's going to give us an overview of, you know, Farmington and Housatonic, the pressure that, you know, what effect has the pressure from COVID been? Also, you know, give us some of his knowledge on Euronymphing and uh, how to target those uh, pressured fish. So, Tori, thank you for, for showing up tonight and, and talking to us. We appreciate it. Hey, thanks for having me. This should uh, be fun. So, as I'm sure all of you noticed, there's a lot more people fishing because of COVID. Um, I believe in uh, that first year COVID hit that fall, I want to say that September, I read that they estimated 10 million new anglers in the USA. And that was just as of September, well, that would have been 2020, right? We're going on, we're going on two years now. And yeah, you know, all these people doing team sports and stuff like that, all of a sudden we're looking for something to do. And I think all of us in the outdoor industry saw things just absolutely, you know, blow up. Um, lots of people that bowled and played baseball and football and basketball, all of a sudden we're looking for something to do to get out of the house and hopefully get away from people. And I think, you know, every outdoor industry, I mean, from what I hear, you, it's hard to get bicycles, canoes, kayaks, um, and that there's certainly a lot more fishermen. And you know that the Farmington was already a pressure river before COVID, and uh, I mean this has only increased the pressure on rivers like the Farmington, increased the pressure on the Housatonic. I was living in Torrington before this. You know the the upper the upper Noggy there. You know, it's a marginal trout stream. Even that was getting uh, pressured in areas where I only occasionally saw people. Um, so how do we deal with pressured trout? Well, I'd say one of the first things you want to do is don't do what everybody else does. <laughs> and I think Einstein's definition of insanity was doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And if Everybody's out there doing similar stuff and having mediocre results. The chances are your results are going to be mediocre also. So what can you do to do things differently? Um, you can use more finesse rigging, such as a longer leader or a longer tippet. Um, on the Farmington, I would say this is, you know, especially beneficial, but, uh, the, the longer tip, it really helps you get a better presentation, a better drag-free float. If you're fishing dry flies, it'll create slack and give you nice S-curves. Um, and if you're nymphing, a longer tip, it will help you sink your nymphs faster, deeper, and with less weight. Um, Another thing you could try to do differently is a lot of people don't get good drifts. You could really focus on perfecting your drifts. And a lot of that has to do with positioning. In other words, where are you standing in relation to where the trout are? Um, if you're fishing dry flies on flat water, especially on a river like the Farmington, if you can, a lot of times the best presentation is to get across and upstream from the fish. So you're feeding your fly 
uh, first to the fish before your, your leader goes over it. And a quick little tip, a great way to get your fly exactly in the lane you need it to is to overcast the fish, maybe, maybe by three to five feet and maybe eight to 10 feet upstream. Then you would lift your rod tip up, drag it until it's in the fish's feeding lane and drop the rod tip. I mean, this doesn't always work. If the currents are screwy, that may pull the slack out of your tip and create drag, but it's a really good way to feed your fly right down to the trout and put it on the money if you're having a hard time making a pinpoint cast. Um, if you're nymphing, you may wanna be more down and across. We'll typically give you the kind of angle that will promote a good dead drift with a nymph. And the closer you can get to the fish, all things being equal, the better. On flat water, fish and dries, you may need to stay a ways away from the fish. Um, but typically in the kind of water where you might be nymphing, where it's riffly or you're at the head of a run or the head of a pool, you can usually get pretty close to the fish, usually within 20 feet. Um, if the water is particularly fast or deep, you know, that may be an issue or if the water is a little slower where you might actually be spooking the fish, then you may need to stay a little further away. For closer presentations, we have some current, a tight line Euro rig is ideal. But you look at the Farmington <clears throat> River in recent years with all the pressure going on, you'll probably find that on any given day of the guys nymphing, probably them better than 50% are doing Euro nymphing or drop shotting or some sort of tight line presentation just because of the, the control it, it gives to you and later in the presentation I'll talk about some of the some of the innovations in the uh euro nymphing world in terms of equipment rigging leaders flies techniques um but everything has its, its time and place an indicator is better when you need to fish further away or if you're fishing really slow water really to, to do that tight line euro type presentation and ideally you want to be closer to the fish under 30 feet and 15 or 20 feet even better if, if you can work it you got to fish further than that consistently or the water's slower you, you're probably better off going with an indicator or even dry dropper um though that's probably more of a um i would say during the hatch season when you have optimum water temps that dry dropper where you're fishing typically fishing the nymph shallower is a good presentation not so much this time of year when you need to fish slow and deep. You know, the fish may be stacked up in four feet of water in the winter. Another tip trick for pressured rivers would be fish at times of the day when there's less people. Typically, that would mean early, late, and bad weather. Working in a fly shop, there will be that early crew that comes in, but most people don't start rolling in much before 10 a.m. And then a lot of people leave around dinner time. Depending on the time of year, you know, that can be a big mistake. I'm, I'm not a big fan of starting real early in the winter when you have, you know, say late fall, winter, early spring, when you have cold water temps. A lot of times when the water temps are below 50, you're, you're better off fishing late morning to late afternoon when the water temps are higher, the fish are more active and there's more bug activity. But uh, that aside, there's definitely something to be said for being there early and late. The old saying the early bird gets some worm has some truth to it. And I feel like unpressured rivers like the Farmington, the Croton watershed, some of the rivers in the Catskills and other rivers I've fished, I feel like the fish kind of reset their brain overnight and they forget all the bad things that happened to them the day before. And the first angler or two that fishes over them, I feel has a better chance of hooking them on some of the pressured spots on the Farmington that are known to everybody in the planet, like the church bull. I can't even imagine during prime time, how many people fish through there in the span of a day and if you're going there in the late afternoon you better you better bring your a game or you better hope there's a good hatch um because the odds get to be stacked against you and the other thing would be the other end of the day a lot of the better hatches on a lot of rivers occur more toward evening a lot of spinner falls occur in the evenings especially 
during the spring and summer. The Housatonic, I always think of as an evening river. It's certainly during uh, you know, May and June when a lot of the famous hatches go on at that river is, is known for. A lot of times the best fishing didn't start until close to dark and would go well after dark if you could find a spot where you could use the the angle of the glare on the water to spot rising fish and just get real close up on the trout. Um, bad weather is another time to go out and you could include winter in that winter weeds out a lot of anglers rainy days you got a Gore-Tex raincoat you can stay nice and dry all day and that'll that'll knock about 90 percent of the anglers out on a given day and it frequently bigs, brings those big brown trout out to feed on rainy days you know high water that would be another thing that scares people off if you know how to how to deal with high water which is typically you're looking at probably fishing closer to the banks, maybe chucking some streamers. A great time to bust out the biggest streamers in your box if you want to head hunt uh, and go for some bigger trout. If you're nymphing, you probably want to go uh, typically maybe some bigger stuff like stonefly type stuff like rubber legs or golden cell nymphs or big prince nymph. Could be junk flies like a mop. Um, if it's appropriate time of year, like fall, winter, early spring, an egg fly, green weenie. I, I remember I remember one day on the Farmington, it was, I think it was like a thousand or fifteen hundred, which is high. Um, and a guide I knew was floating the river and I was in Boneyard and he was speed rowing down the river. He said that they were just gonna call it early. They they'd had a really, really tough a few hours and they were just going to call it early and go drown their sorrows and get a hamburger and uh i touched base with him a couple of days later he asked me how i did and i got i said oh i got 17 trout and he, he looked shocked and uh it took a little while to crack the code but that particular day it was the junk fly it was a green weenie which is really nothing more than chartreuse chenille wrapped on a hook <laughs> And that made all the difference that day. I got, you know, probably 80, 90% of my, of my fish on that. Didn't really see anybody else fishing and it had a really good day. Hey, Another Tori, thing you could do Tori, to get what away about from people, if the river's big enough to float, like, like the Housatonic is a great river to float. And even the Farmington, if you, if you get a, you know, if you get some higher water, say 600 plus, 600 plus CFS, um, could be a good time to float it and it'll, It'll let you cover a ton of water. It'll let you get away from some of the popular spots. Um, <clears throat> I see somebody made a little comment about night fishing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm not a big night guy. I used to do, when I used to fish the Housatonic a lot back in the day, I did used to fish a lot after dark. Um, though it wasn't what I would call true night fishing. I was typically putting myself places where I could see fish rising. A lot of nights I'd fish 11 or 12 at night and then, I go home and get dinner um, and I was walking away from rising fish. And I'll talk a little more about that when I get specific to the Hoosie. Um, the other thing you can do is just walk. Just when you can find parts where the access points are spread out, either you know, will be willing to walk farther than the average guy or maybe cross the river and fish from the other side where you're hitting spots that other people don't hit a lot, or maybe you're hitting it from the side of the river that 95% of the guys don't fish it from. And on rivers like the Farmington and the Housatonic, where you have uh, trout management areas or catch and release areas, they, they seem to really suck up a lot of the pressure. Fly fishermen really gravitate. You slap the words fly fishing or catch and release on a section of water, and the assumption is that there's more and bigger fish and better fishing. And, you know, to a degree, that that is absolutely true. I think, I think on the Housatonic and the Farmington, you probably have your highest trout density in the catch and release sections, but you, you also have your highest fishing pressure. I've I've had some great fishing on the Housatonic outside of the catch and release area, um, and geez, I bet you two out of three years I catch my biggest trout on the Farmington outside of the catch and release area. You know, and I'm not even I'm not even really talking about brood stock fish that they dump in the river. I mean, like, I mean, real fish, fish that are, you know, either holdovers or wild trout. So don't don't be afraid to fish outside of the catch and release series. The, the trout density may be a little lower, but there's usually enough trout 
to make it worth your while if it's a good trout stream. And the reduced pressure makes those fish act a lot more normally and a lot easier to catch them. And one other, one other thing before I go specifically into the Hoosie and the Farmington is a, I think a really neglected technique is wet flies. I think nowadays everybody's, everybody's either fishing dry flies, streamers, or they're, or they're euro nymphing or they're, or they're indicator nymphing. And it's still a very effective method. Um, you know, the way the average person does it, they probably run one fly and they probably throw it down and across and swing it. And that can absolutely be effective at times, especially if there's an insect emergence or an egg laying event. And especially if it's a really active bug like, like caddis pupa or egg laying caddis or some of the mayflies that, that swim when they hatch like a, like a quill gordon or isonychia. But the Probably the most effective way to fish wet flies is going old school and a minimum of two, if not three. If I'm really wet fly fishing and I'm not just screwing around, I, I go three wet flies. I had the chance over the years to fish with Davey Watton more than a couple of times. For those of you who don't know, he's one of the best living wet fly fishermen in the world. And he got taught how to fish wet, uh, wet flies in Europe. He's, he's from Wales. Um, by the old, by the old timers who still did that technique a lot. And, um, his basic setup is either a floating or an inter intermediate line, three flies, the floating line, you'd run them maybe 30 inches apart, give or take and with the intermediate line. You'd probably run them a little closer, maybe 20 inches apart. And then with a, with a floating line, you know, maybe a 10 to 12 foot total length leader, maybe about six feet to your first fly, roughly, give or take. Um, you could just, you could either use a store-bought leader and cut it down, or you could tie your own leader. Just, you just do a three-piece butt section. You, just, you don't have to go that heavy, maybe 15, 12, and 10 pound maxima or amnesia, then a tippet ring, and then run four or five X could be as heavy as three could be as light as six, but you don't want to go too light because you get a lot of hard. Hits. Um, but you want to rig them on tag and droppers. You don't want to rig them in line. You don't want to tie the fly on and then tie the next piece of tippet directly to the hook eye or the hook bend. Like, like you might do if you were indicator and thing, but rather <clears throat> you either want to create a dropper knot by leaving the tag end long on a surgeon's knot or a blood knot. Don't keep it too long. I mean, you can leave it a little longer so you can tie the fly on, but you probably want it to be four to six inches long once the fly is tied. The longer you leave it, the more fly changes you'll get, the better fly action, but the more tangles you would get. The shorter you keep it, you will definitely get less tangles. I wouldn't go any shorter than about three inches, though. That's about the shortest. So somewhere in that three to six inch range. Um, you want to mix up your flies. You might want to do a mix of a traditional winged wet some sort of soft tackle and somewhere in your string of flies, you probably want something more imitative, maybe something more of an attractor. Uh, I'd probably typically put my heaviest fly, my biggest fly, excuse me, on the bottom. Typically you're using unweighted flies. I know, I know Davey uh, is vehemently against using weighted flies. He feels like it reduces the animation of the flies. And that's one of the, the things he really like, likes about the method is the movement you get in the flies, he tends to use 5X because you know, the more flexibility in the tippets lets the, lets the fly move better. I, I, I definitely am not one of these people who thinks that when you go on the light tippet that you catch more fish sometimes because your tippet's suddenly invisible. I think it's just your fly moves better and it's easier to get a drag free drift with a light tippet. And if you're, if you're nymphing, it gets your fly down quicker, with less weight. I, I don't think it's so much a visibility thing. You just don't want to go too light with the wet flies and the soft tackles because they can snap you off. And, you know, don't just do the down and across presentation. Play around. I would say across and up with a mend, kind of a dead drift. Keep your rod tip up so your line's hanging down from your rod tip and you have a little bit of sag. And this does several things. It'll, it'll cushion it when a fish takes your fly. If you keep a little bow in your line, you can use it to detect subtle hits when that bow straightens. And 
if you're animating the fly by moving your rod tip during a drift, which a guy like Davey does a lot, he'll do little tiny movements and he'll often do a hand twist or a figure eight retrieve. Each time you move it or pull a little line, you kind of take the bow out of the line and it pulls the fly tight, it moves the fly. And then when you stop, your fly line having some weight will, will once again sag or bow below your rod tip and it'll give you like a secondary smaller movement. So it adds to the animation or the lifelike movement of the flies. You know, then let it come around for sure. Let it come around and go on that traditional swing. Um, let it dangle below you and then even take your rod tip up and, and you know, move the flies. You can even dance a little on the surface, drop it, do it a couple of times. And you'll probably notice that you get the majority of your strikes on any given moment during one phase of the drift more than others. Some days it'll be dead drift. Some days it'll be just as it starts to swing. Some days it'll be on dangle. And some days it'll be when you're twitching them on top and dancing them on top at the end of the drift. Uh, Davey Watton's got a really good DVD out on that. I don't know. I don't know if there's any digital downloads for that, but, uh, it's called Wet Fly Ways. It's excellent. And if you want a good book to read on that, uh, Dave Hughes updated his book on wet flies probably about three years ago. And it's probably one of the better currently in print books on wet flies. He's got a chapter on Davey Watton in there. And one more little secret of wet flies. I, I've got several people I know that I would consider ex expert wet fly fishermen. And almost to a man, they, they use a intermediate line more than a floating line. I asked Davey, he said he uses it about 50% of the time. He prefers to use a floater, but he'll use an intermediate and it ends up being his go-to half the time. And most of my other friends that do a lot of it, they mostly use an intermediate line. You know, it gets your flies deeper, it slows them, it's a little better in the wind. Um, so, okay, enough about wet flies. Uh, let's see, what kind of water is easiest for the wet fly? Somebody's asking. The easiest water for the wet fly would probably be water that has some chop and some current to it. Um, deep enough to hold fish, but not, not insanely deep. You know, I'd say probably, you know, knee to waist deep water would be, would be ideal, but you can certainly fish shallower and deeper water than that. Um, you know, the more even the current it is, the more uh, the easier it is to get a consistent swing and presentation. Obviously, the more convoluted the currents are and the trickier they are, it's going to involve some finagling and line mending and manipulation. Just like I mentioned before, positioning is important. And just like anything else, the closer you can get to your intended target area, the more likely you are to be successful because you'll have better control over your flies. Make sure you keep your rod tip up. You're typically going to have it somewhere, you know, I don't know, say, let's say 10 o'clock, you know, a little above parallel. You just want to make sure you got some line sagging off your rod tip. Again, that'll, that'll help you hook the, that'll also help you hook the fish because trout don't grab, they inhale. They'll come up behind your fly and then they'll try to inhale it by sucking water through their gills. And if you don't have a little bit of controlled slack in there, they may not be able to get the fly in your mouth and you'll, you'll feel that light tap, but they never really got it in their mouth good. And that's why people miss a lot of fish uh, when they're swinging flies, especially wet flies. Let me talk a little first specifically about the Housatonic and then specifically on the Farmington. And then I'll, I'll talk about some of the more recent innovations in the, in the nymphing world. <clears throat> So the Housatonic's a river, well, I haven't fished it much in recent years. It's a river I spent a lot of time in the past and it's near and dear to my heart. It's, it's a big river. It in many ways fishes like you're out west. Oh, it, just going right back, Dave Veluzzo is talking about a long rod for wet fly fishing. Yes, a, you can totally do it with your nine foot five weight but a 10 to 11 foot rod for a, probably a three or a four weight with a soft tip. Honestly, the same rod you'd use for your own nymphing or a medium fast 10 foot four weight, something like that is ideal for wet flies. So back to the Housatonic. Housatonic is a Western looking river, very scenic in the Berkshire Hills there, very fertile. It flows through a lot of limestone ge geology. It is, 
absolutely um absolutely gorgeous river very fertile because of the limestone and lots of structure on the bottom so there's lots of habitat for bigger nymphs like march brown isonychia stone flies that river absolutely is loaded with golden stone flies and other stone flies gets some giant isonychias they're the size of green drakes i've seen them size six there isonychias um tons of minnows a lot of darters uh a lot of fall fish which some people will call dace or chubs they look like a like a baby tarpon anybody that's fished the housatonic is probably familiar with those we don't really have those on a farmington until you start getting down to collinsville unionville where it's a little warmer then you'll start seeing a few of those and the housatonic is loaded with crayfish and that is absolutely i'd say probably april through october one of the primary targets of the big holdover trout in there the housatonic from what i've seen doesn't have a lot of wild trout in it some of the tribs do so there's some movement in and out um, but a lot of the holdovers there are beautiful. And if you don't look them over very carefully, you might think they're wild. There's usually a little fin damage when you look them over. So because the river is so fertile, it gets really good hatches. And you got to know how to fish hatches there. When uh, the fish have the luxury of an abundant food supply, they can get what us humans would think of as picky. So in nature, animals like to pick on the weak. And when it comes to hatches, those would be like your cripples, your spinners. Uh, in the case of mayflies, the spinners, your stents. And uh, those are critical when you're fishing the Housatonic during a hatch. I, during most mayfly hatches, I hardly ever fish done imitations or, you know, the traditional upright wing adults anymore. I most commonly am going to fish some sort of a merger slash cripple pattern. Usually something that has a trailing shock. Usually the body's usually partly in the film. Part of it may even hang underneath the film. And you'll find that you'll be more successful on picky trout with those. And you'll find that the bigger trout will tend to key in on those because those can't get away. The same with spinners, a spent mayfly spinner, the wings are stuck in the surface film and cannot get away. Um, and the bigger trout will, will target those. I, I always tended to hook my biggest trout at Hendrickson time there, usually at dusk or in the dark on a Hendrickson spinners. That would really get the big fish out. Um, yeah, compare it with a Zelon shuck. That's a very effective fly. And that would be the second you put a shuck on it, and then given that the comparatum body sits in the film, you definitely have a, an emerger slash cripple type pattern. So that, that would qualify as, as the type of pattern, you know, that I'm talking about. I'll, I'll, I'll tie something like that. I'll use like a Zelon shuck, whatever dubbing matches for the body. And then I'll do a rabbit's foot wing instead of deer hair. I just find that to be, very effective, very durable. You could catch 30 trout on it, you know, during, during a really good hatch. And as long as you keep cleaning it off and putting floating on it, you can keep using it. Um, a lot of the spinner falls in the spring there, especially mid to late spring, happen at dusk to dark and beyond. So if you can have a snack or an early dinner and stay late, or you're going to miss a lot of the best hatching act activity on that river. Another, uh, another cool thing about the Housatonic, because of the limestone geology, there is a pile of scuds in there. By and large, I don't see a ton of scuds in rivers in Connecticut. There, there are some, definitely some rivers with you know, decent scud populations, and a lot of rivers have at least a few. I know the Pomperog's got a decent amount of scuds um, from a friend of mine. But um, the Housatonic is absolutely loaded with scuds. Now, the interesting part is, from what I can see, during prime hatch season, I don't think they eat a whole lot of scuds. I think there's so many other bugs that are more available that they focus on those. But starting around, say, mid-fall, maybe late October, early November, especially when you get that leaf packed by the shore, 
those scuds seem to migrate into that leaf pack to feed on the detritus. And especially if you get a little flow bump, it'll, it'll knock them into the drift. Um, so I would say if, if you're there in the quote unquote off season, make sure you try a scud if you're nymphing, you know, especially that November, December, January, February, March time period. Another go-to fly if you're nymphing on that river would be uh, a prince nymph. And don't be afraid to go big there. We've fished them as big as sixes, but tens, twelves. Um, stone, big stone flies. There are a staple pattern. I, I I tend to lean toward a golden stone, but it could be a specific golden stone. It could be a rubber legs. Um, it could be a big black stone. But I'm talking sixes, eights, tens. There's just a plethora of them in there. Is that Dave Shaw? <laughs> um i touched on crayfish that river is absolutely loaded with crayfish and without a doubt i think the big fish make their living a lot of the year on crayfish and i i think it's what gives those holdovers there that just incredible coppery orangey bronzy coloration so there's a lot of patterns out there you could use to imitate crayfish. I, I think sometimes a rubber leg gets taken as that. There's that Joe Goodspeed crayfish that Fulling Mill does. We carry it that at the shop. It's getting more popular. And there's lots of other patterns there. You know, to be honest, I'm sure a, a smaller woolly bugger, and depending how you fish it, could certainly pass as a crayfish if you tie it in crayfishy colors like tans, browns, olives. Um, a few other fly patterns and stuff that I consider staples on that river would be that river is definitely a caddis river there is a pile in there and those caddis are usually active the in hatching by early May and I, I've caught a lot of my bigger fish from there when I'm nymphing on caddis pupa they'll just especially in the mornings they'll, they'll just slide right up into the fast shallow ripples at the heads of the runs and the pools and you could get some big 20 inch plus fish just gorging on on caddis pupa so don't overlook that and some other flies you want to have in your box for there would be a muddler, a usual, and a white wolf. White, white wolf, you put on right before dark. You cut your leader back to like 3X and shorten it. And then if you want, you can trail a, a, a smaller hatch matching dry off the back end of it. But you'd be surprised at how many fish will eat a big white wolf, even when there's a shitload of size 16, 18 sulfurs on the water. And I caught a lot of big fish there at dusk and after dark on white wolves. The muddler's another great fly there. Um, I like to fish that during hatch time at, when I'm fishing at dusk and after dark. I'll, I'll take a, about a size six or eight unweighted muddler and I'll grease it up and I'll either dead drift it like a dry or I'll, I'll swing it down and across. And usually they only want it one of those two ways and it'll vary from night to night, but I've hooked some really big fish doing that and usual tied in the standard kind of cream color usually in a 14 but it could be bigger smaller you could vary the colors that's another great evening fly there in the spring and summer uh they have a lot of cahill type cream colored mayflies in that 12 14 16 range let's talk about the farmington specifically now so the farmington is a very different river I mean, the Housatonic, there is a dam, but it's a shallow impoundment and it has zero beneficial thermal effects. It's basically a big silt catcher and it spreads the river out and slows it down and makes it warmer. And the Housatonic will typically shit the bed for trout fishing sometime between the latter part of June and the beginning of July. And then it usually kicks back into gear in September when we start getting nights in the 50s and 40s and the, the daytime highs start not getting so high. Whereas on the Farmington, it runs cool in the summer and it runs a little warmer in the winter. It's fishable in January and February. If we get a cold January and February, the Housatonic will, will slush up and, and freeze up on, on you. Um, so the Farmington has, has less variability. I mean, it's a true bottom release tailwater coming out of Goodwin Dam. A lot, a lot of people call it Hogback Dam because it's on Hogback Road. Um, and there's another big reservoir above that would be Colebrook, which straddles the Connecticut mass border. And then it dumps directly from Colebrook into Hogback. There's no real riverine section between them. So the Farmington 
is highly pressured. It, it is the epitome of a pressured trout stream. And being a tailwater, it has a plethora of different hatches, um, not necessarily as heavy as the Housatonic on some of the hatches, but a very wide variety. It has an abundance of average to small size bugs where the, the Housatonic, you know, has the whole nine yards, but you get a lot of average to big bugs on the Housatonic. You definitely can fish bigger bugs there. If you're, if you're regular on the Farmington and you're matching a hatch or you're fishing hatch matching nymphs, you're definitely going to want to have some smaller stuff in your arsenal. It's, you know, it's not uncommon for the regulars and fish in those flat water pools like, like Church Pool and Greenwoods and Beaver to be fishing 24s, 26s, 28s, and lamenting the fact that uh, Tamco doesn't make size 32 hooks anymore. Um, I mentioned before, long leaders, definitely a big asset on the Farmington. If you're fishing flat water with your eyes, a lot of guys are fishing 15 to even as much as 20 foot liters. If you're nymphing, especially Euro nymphing, that longer leader will enable you to fish further away and get a better presentation. I'll go, I'll go more into that when I, when I go into the Euro nymphing after this. Um, fish outside the catch and release area, just like every other river, that catch and release, yes, it has the most fish. And yes, it definitely gets the most pressure. The Housatonic River, excuse me, the Farmington River is probably, probably the most pressured river in the Northeast if you measure it on a year round 12 month basis. And, you know, I would, I would, I would guess it's one of the most pressured rivers in the country. Um, so one thing you can do to put the odds in your favor, try to get into some water that's not as pressured. Guess what? They stock, oh my God, they must stock 40 miles of that river. And they manage the, the first 21 miles below it as a, as a trout management area with different regulations on different sections. You got six miles that are year round catch and release. You got four miles above that between there and the dam from Whittemore to the dam that is catch and release from September until opening day in April. And then from opening day through the end of August, it's two fish, 12 inches. And that it goes back to that same regulation in New Hartford below the 219 bridge from there all the way down to Unionville, the route 177 bridge. That's another, so let's see, we're 10. That's about another 11 miles. That's under that two fish, 12 inches in a, in the spring and summer, and then it's catch and release from September. There's plenty of fish outside the catch and release area, even right now, even though they, you know, even though they haven't stocked in a long time. Um, yes, there's a lot of fish in a catch and release. When they, a couple of years ago, they got the best electroshocking they ever got. And in two miles of the catch and release, they shocked 5,900 trout. So that's just shy of, let's call that 3,000 fish per mile. That, that's a lot. That's a lot. That's a, uh, you know, those are world-class numbers. Um, but even though outside of the catch and release area, you know, it might be a thousand fish per mile. It might be 500 fish per mile. I couldn't give you the exact figure. I can tell you there's, there's a good amount of wild trout in the Farmington river and the numbers are only increasing over the years from what I can see. And you go outside of the catch and release area, especially downstream for many, many, many miles, there is a lot of wild brown trout. You'll fish some of those pocket water sections in the spring and summer. You won't believe how many uh, six to 12 inch wild browns you'll catch that are in that shallower pocket water. And some of them are holding over to much bigger sizes than that. You know, wild trout have, of course, better genetics. They grow faster, they're more res disease resistant, they're, they're harder to catch, they're spookier. They're just a, just a superior product. So fish outside of the TMA, you know, the river gets well stocked too. So there'll typically be some little bit easier targets if, a, if the wild trout are a little too tough with you. So some specific flies, you know, definitely make sure you got some smaller stuff, find out what the hatches are going to be. Make sure you got hatch matching stuff with a focus on the emerger slash cripples. And in the case of a mayfly, make sure you got some spinners. There's tons of caddis in the river, both cased um, and the ones that don't make cases, which would be your net spinners, your, your hydropsyche, your chematopsyche, which are some of the more common caddis you'll, you'll see in trout streams. So make sure you got caddis larvae. Um, I catch a lot of trout on caddis larvae in the winter 
in early spring in particular, all year really, uh, but especially in the winter, early spring. I've caught fish on case caddis. That's an underutilized fly on the Farmington and a lot of rivers um, year round, but uh, especially in, you know, starting maybe say around now, February, March, April, um, especially if we get a flow bump, case caddis live in a little bit slower water. And, you know, they tend to live a lot of them on top of rocks or on a backside. And when, when you get a big flow bump and the water comes up fast, a lot of them get knocked into the drift and become trout food. I've also done very well this time of year, right into the spring when the water's up on dark colored rubber leg nymphs, like sixes, eights, tens. There's a lot of, there's Helgramites in the Farmington. Um, I don't think there's as many as in the, the Housatonic has just a plethora of big dark brown, like probably averaging three inches long, some of them four. Uh, the Farmington ones seem to be a little lighter, more of a lighter brown, the ones I see. Um, and, and on average, probably not as big as, as in the Housatonic. But what I do see a lot of, um, not so much in the river, but in the trout's mouths, I've had them crap them out of my landing net and I've had them throw them up in my landing net more times than I could count. And, you know, as we cut into like March, April, May, when the water's high. And a lot of those days I just whaled fish on the, like a dark brown rubber legs. I've tried tying a specific imitation for a fish fly larva, um, but I haven't done any better than just a dark colored rubber legs about a size eight or a 10. That's about, that's about the size the fish fly larva are on, maybe an inch and a half long, inch, inch and a half. They're, they're like a small helgramite, but the trout eat them, especially when we get flow bumps. Another thing, because the Farmington stays cool in the summer, the trout are active throughout the summer. So terrestrial insects figure prominently into their diet, into the fish catching. So if you're coming here, you know, as soon as the weather gets mild, like June, July, August, September in particular, make sure you have ants, beetles, maybe even a few hoppers. Um, but especially ants and beetles in a variety of sizes. You can, you can catch fish during the day when things are slow. When you have sporadic risers, you can blind fish them. Um, many times when I was waiting around for a hatch, you know, put a beetle on and been able to pick up fish on a beetle until the hatch got going. So make sure you got your terrestrials. Uh, okay, so those are my quick tips for the Farmington. And the oh the early early and late in the day bad weather high dirty water all that stuff you know pressured river anything you can do to get away from the people early late high water farmington fish as well in high water and just like you think you know streamers junk flies bigger nymphs things like that typically and it's typically going to push the fish closer to the banks just just like just like anywhere else one other thing, actually, jig streamers. And I'll, I'll also, maybe I'll segue into the, the Euro uh, recent innovations with that. In the last two years, I'd say jig streamers, typically small to medium sized, have I've got some real traction in the, in the nymphing world. And tight lining a weighted jigged streamer is absolutely lethal sometimes. I mean, not all the time, no, nothing's deadly all the time. Um, and, you know, people have been doing this for a while. I, I wouldn't say it's anything new per se. It getting popular and done on a longer Euro rod, on a longer Euro leader. Um, of course, now you have tons of jig hooks on the market of all different shank lengths. You have all different size slotted beads and slotted beads are great because the way they sit on a jig hook and they also allow you to oversize the bead even as much as several sizes if, if necessary. And I can tell you that jig streamers are very effective in just about every river, including the Farmington. And a lot of the, for those of you who follow our social media or, or look on our river report that we update twice a week, a lot of the big trout you've seen since the fall and this winter, I bet you better than half, maybe as many as three quarter were caught by customers using various jig streamers and tight lining them on a on a euro rig it just gives you tremendous control over them because of the long leaders or even a mono rig with the long section of tippets below a colored cider on a euro rig you have tremendous control 
Because most of the time, unless you're fishing far away, you have nothing but tippet in the water. And you have a longer rod to help you control your drift. You're able to get your streamer down near the bottom quickly, keep it there, be in good contact with it. You don't have a fat floating fly line on the surface current pulling on your fly and lifting it up off the bottom and speeding it up. Remember that basic hydrodynamics is that the water on the bottom is slower than the water near the surface due to friction. So the problem with a typical fly line is fly lines are thick. The current pushes on them and it pulls your streamer and it may want to fish it at a faster speed that you want to present it. And certainly when the water's cold or when the water's high, you can get a really nice presentation with a jig streamer and the appropriate weight. You know, typically guys are tying, I might say a four millimeter bead would be fairly average um, on the Farmington. You know, you probably want to have some lighter. You can get 4.6 millimeter beads. There's even, there's even 5.5 millimeter beads out there. I, in fact, I just ordered some, hopefully those will be in soon, but uh, typically in that three and a half, four, four and a half millimeter range. You can add some lead to the hook, typically tying them on a size eight, size 10, maybe a size 12 standard jig hook. Flies often have shorter bodies made of various materials. Could be an EP brush, could be, could be medium polar chenille, could be dubbing. And then usually there's some sort of tail or back or wing made out of either marabou or, or zonker strips or pine squirrel zonker strips or some combination of the above. And uh, these have gotten really popular in the last two years and they're very effective, especially on big trout. I know when I, when I started fishing these a lot a couple of years ago in, in March and April, geez, I probably caught 80 or 90% of the trout, 18 inches and up I caught, were probably on jig streamers. And when I'm doing that on a Euro rig, I'll typically, I'll typically leave a nymph as a dropper fly above my streamer. And uh, you know, some days the fish will be all about the jig streamer. Other days it'll be a mix and other days you'll get most of them on, on your, uh, on your nymph dropper above it, but you may pull the biggest fish on the jig streamer. And it's funny cause sometimes I don't even, I'll fish through a run <clears throat> and then I'll say, okay, I'm going to put the jig streamer on, see if there's something bigger in here. And uh, there's a lot of ways you can fish a jig streamer. I mean, the, the typical way that I would most commonly fish, it would be an up and across cast. You're keeping your, your cider off the water and I'll, I'll, I'll dead drift it, but I'll also twitch it. I'll let it drift two or three feet and then I'll twitch it. Just not a huge twitch, a little twitch. I'll let it drift a little, then I'll twitch it. Sometimes I'll totally dead drift it. And then I'll let it come around below me. And of course I'll let it swing. And you'll get a lot of hits right when it starts to swing up off the bottom. That's kind of a magic moment. A lot of times if I time it, so right as it swings up, I give it one or two little twitches. You know, if you can have that phase of your drift right in front of a big trout, it's very hard for them to resist that presentation. And then a lot of times I will let it fish to the dangle straight below me. I may even leave it there and twitch it a little bit. And with this rig, you can also, if you're come to a section of flat water, you can throw it straight across and strip it in like a normal presentation. So it's, it's a pretty versatile way. It'll let you cover water. You know, typically you're fishing that medium to fast water with a, with a Euro uh, rod and a Euro rig. This will expand your, your versatility out. So that's one of the things in your world that's gotten really big in the last two years. The general trend overall has been longer, lighter, thinner. Um, I don't know if the rods are going to get much longer, even as the material gets lighter and stronger and better. I, I think that 10 to 11 foot length is, is sort of where the dust is settled. Guys in PA that fish a lot of small streams set more toward 10 footers. Guys that fish at Farmington a lot tend to fish probably more 10 and a half to 11 because it's a little bigger river. It'll give you a little more reach. It'll let you fish further away, make a longer drift. Um, but, you know, to a certain degree, some of it is personal preference. Some people I know prefer 10 footers. Some people prefer 11 footers. Um, I'm happy with anything 10 and a half footer up generally. I, I feel a little handicapped with a 10 footer, although I do own Euro rods down to 10 feet. Um, you're seeing a lot more guys fishing two weight. I'd say a three weight was kind of, has kind of become the default Euro rod and the two weight starting to give it some competition. Uh, I was talking to Josh Miller, who is uh, a very accomplished uh, competitive angler. For those of you who don't know who he is, 
he uh he was on the uh, adult team you know he's competed in other countries around the world in the world championships he's he coaches the the youth fly fishing team he's a fishing guide and he's a he's a fishy dude i've gotten to fish with him you know he's a guy that if you put him on a high density trout stream and the bites on it wouldn't be unusual for him to catch 100 trout in a day and i'm not i'm not ex- i'm not um exaggerating and he works in a shop in uh pittsburgh pa and he said probably 19 out of 20 rods they sell are two weights because he and the guys in the shop push two weights because they all fish two weights um he likes to fish a lot of thin tippet so parallel to the rods getting um lighter and thinner with two weights and even even one weight rods are starting to come onto the market now um Cortland's coming out with it they already have a 10 foot two weight I'm not excuse me not Cortland uh Thomas and Thomas they're coming out they already have a 10 foot two weight in their contact they're coming out with a 10 foot nine inch two weight in March um Diamondback is coming out with a series of rods down to a one weight and I know there's already been European rods on the market down to zero weights uh hardy has one they rate as a zero slash two um some of the line weightings seem arbitrary sometimes because you're not typically throwing fly line on a euro rod although though you can for sure and some people do uh but the the lighter rods with the softer tips will protect thinner tippet so a thinner tippet will sink your flies quicker with less weight the general consensus is that the lighter the flies you can fish and get down near the bottom in the strike zone or wherever the strike zone is, which by the way, isn't always on the bottom. It's usually a little above the bottom. It could be midwater column, could even be higher. Uh, depends on the day, hatch activity, water levels, water temperatures, light conditions, all those affect all that. But guys like Josh and a lot of comp anglers, the guys that are like serious comp anglers, they don't fish at much heavier than six X much. And you, you'll find a lot of them, they're fishing six and a half, seven, believe it or not, even eight X. And there's companies make that make line with thinner designations of that. Though they're usually <clears throat> kind of playing a little game where they call it nine X, 10 X, 11 X, 12 X, 13 X. And it's really eight X or eight and a quarter X or eight and a half X. But um, sometimes to, to sink, just a there's reasons why you might just want to fish a, a single nymph when you're euro nymphing it uh, i'd say two is typical usually you have your anchor nymph on the bottom that's your heavier fly most commonly and then you have your smaller lighter dropper flying above it and you you may put something that might imitate bugs that might be hatching that'll be riding a little higher in a, the water column so you know i'm trying to go thinner myself i'm always fighting between i like catching big trout and i hate snapping a fish off and of course i hate losing more flies than i have to to snags but I, you know i'm doing a lot of 6x nowadays um i say prior to that i was doing 5x and I'm, I'm probably gonna i'm probably gonna play around a little with 7x this year not when i'm in a snaggy area that has a lot of big trout but uh you gotta remember the comp guys though they're going for numbers they're not going for big fish per se although they do catch big fish on these late tippets you know they're typically looking to catch as many you win a comp by catching a lot of trout and usually anything about eight inches or bigger scores. So, you know, seven X tip it isn't a problem when you're targeting eight to 12 inch trout. If you're targeting 18 to 24 inch trout, uh, might not be the most recommended tippet size to use. Um, believe it or not, I, I probably fish five X tip it with those jig streamers more than anything. And I, I almost, Jeez, I don't even know if I've broken one off fishing at. I'm I'm so cognizant of keeping my rod tip up and not letting it drop. And with those with those long rods with limber tips, it really protects the tippet. And the cool thing about the Euro rods is even in the even in a two weight, a well-designed Euro rod, the lower half of the rod has a lot of power. And you could land a two-foot trout on them if you know how to play trout. I've geez, on my on my three weights, I've landed. I've landed like broodstock rainbows over eight pounds and just scads of brown trout from probably, I don't know, you know, lots from three to six pounds and most of them in one to two minutes. Um, I don't think I've ever played a big trout from where, you know, landed, you know, past three or four minutes. I, I used to guide for steelhead. So I, I do have a lot of experience playing big fish. 
on leg tackle. So concurrent with these thinner tippets and lighter rods, um, paragones. So paragones, the, the French would probably say they invented it and the Spanish would probably say they invented it. Is, uh, paragones are basically uh, slim bodied, very smooth flies with no dubbing. They don't have CDC collars. It's typically a sparse Coke de Leon tail, a body material out of either thread, floss, tinsel, could be stripped, peacock eye, things of that nature, things that are smooth. And then you coat the body with UV resin. Um, typically, the stereotypical Spanish paradigm typically has some sort of tinsel body and they have all sorts of funky tinsels they have with just all sorts of crazy effects. Um, some, of, some of them are iridescent, some of them are UV, some of them are pearl. Um, and they commonly will put a hot spot, not always, not always, but uh, you'll see a lot of them with a hot spot, a tinsel body. And another common feature you'll probably see on about two thirds of paradigms, they'll take either black nail polish or black UV resin and they'll make kind of right at the neck of the fly where it kind of the bead, right about where you put the hot spot, like maybe going up onto the bead and a little bit onto the body of the fly, they'll put a black, a big black dot there to kind of imitate a, oh, a wing case. And a lot of people feel that makes them more effective. Some people think it doesn't matter. Um, probably put a wing case on my pair of goals more often than not, but I don't put a wing case on all of them. And you can tie them imitative. You could tie them, you know, in a little bit drabber, in olive. Uh, if you want to make a hot spot, but you want it subtle, you could do something that's not fluorescent. Maybe you could do some red thread or you could do, I don't know, you could do a couple of wraps of a thin pearl tinsel or something like that. Um, or you could put the hot spot at the butt of the fly. That's a you know, the pressured trout see a lot of flies with hot spots nowadays. And there, there are days when uh, they seem to shy away from them. And there's other days when they're, they're all over them, you know, like a cheap soup. So it pays to experiment. Typically, if one of my flies is a hot spot, the other will be drabber. Um, so yeah, paradigms. Definitely get you some. You can oversize the beads. And these are flies you can fish in 16s, 18s, and 20s and fish a pair of them. And especially if you got light tippet, you know, like six X, no heavier than five X, and you could even go down to seven, you're gonna get them down to the bottom quickly. And you don't necessarily have to use ginormous beads where you might need to use a four mil bead on a fly that is bulky with you no know, dubbing or legs. You might get away with a three mil bead on your anchor. Um, so yeah, most of the paradigms I tie, I do have some of three and a half and four mil beads, but most of my tie are probably two, 2.5s, probably most commonly three mil. Um, in you know, the lighter tip, it helps you get those those uh, smaller beads down. I think I think the flies drift better too when they're not as heavy. If you can still get them down to depth. So, like I said, have that mix of drab and gaudy flies because you just never know. And make sure you know the old school way when your Olympic first came out, like 15, 20 years ago, and hit the USA. I was pull. I was using flies that were too heavy and pulling them. Don't do that. Um, that old school leader shorter than the rod tip, three heavily weighted flies, dragging them under your rod tip slightly faster than the surface bubbles. That, that's pretty much out the window. Um, yeah, it'll, it'll catch fish, but the guy who's dead drifting his flies, you know, just moving your rod tip at the same speed that your flies are going, he's going to catch a lot more fish day in and day out. I mean, for sure, if you come to a spot in your drift where, it kind of slows down. Sometimes you may nudge it along or, or maybe you're walking through an area and there's a spot you want to make three casts in and your flies are a little heavy. So, you know, you either hold your cider a little further off the water and, or you pull your flies a little faster so they don't hang up. You do what you got to do. It doesn't make sense to change your flies. If you're only going to make two or three casts to a spot and you're going to move back to some deeper, faster water. However, you know, as, as the water changes, being able to tie your knots quickly and change your fly weights is critical. You, you can make some pretty cool adjustments with a Euro rig that if you were indicator nymphing, you know, you'd either have to move your indicator further away or closer and or add or subtract split shot. And some of the adjustments with the, with the Euro rod you can do, a lot of it is um, if, you're, if you're fishing not too far away, say under 20 feet, 
the angle of your leader going into the water will affect how deep your fly is. So if you have your rod almost vertical, your cider is almost vertical, so your rod tips are fishing almost under your rod tip or straight out from it, your flies are gonna be at their deepest because you have less tippet in the water, so you have less hydrodynamic drag. If you have it at a, say 45 to 60 degree angle above the water, they're gonna ride a little bit higher because you now have more tippet in the water. And if you drop it down to 20 or 30 degrees below the water, they're gonna ride even shallower. So I got the fish with Gordon Vanderpool in North Carolina last year and he coaches the youth team just like, uh, just like uh, Josh does. And uh, they actually did a nymph clinic for us last fall. And uh, Gordon used to compete and he coaches competitive anglers. And uh, you kind of the takeaways from my day fishing with him were adjust your cast. Like we were fishing some pocket water, some heavy pocket water for predominantly wild rainbows, some socked rainbows, and there's some wild browns in there that we didn't get any of the afternoon. But make your first cast, give it a low angle so your fly ride shallower. Then you know, then after that, then then do a you know closer to a 45 degree angle, 45 to 60 degree angle. And then do one with your rod almost, you know, a cast or two or a drift or two with your rod almost vertical so your fly goes deeper. And then he also does another cool thing in uh, the book Tactical Fly Fishing by Devin Olson. He talks about something Pat Weiss does. Pat Weiss is, he's on Team USA. He's a, you know, phenomenal angler, competes in these competitions at the, at the world championships. I think one year he finished fourth you know, among the best in Europe and the Europeans are, you know, largely considered the best in the world. He just missed the medal. Anyways, he's, he's really good. Um, George Daniel told me Pat is just like one of the best nymph fishermen in the USA. And one of the things Pat will do, he'll do what, what Devin calls an inverted drift where you make your normal cast. And then when your fly gets across from you, you stop, you stop tracking your rod downstream with the fly. So you just hold your fly straight across the stream. You let your nymphs come around, they pendulum, they get downstream ahead of your rod, maybe like that. And then you follow your rod down at the same rate. And I asked him what that, I asked Gordon what that did. And he said he didn't know, but it just makes the flies drift differently. And some days he said they're all over that. Um, I think, I think he called it like a, I forget what they called that, the Colorado drift or something like that. But Devin calls that you know, the inverted cider. But it's just another way to present your flies. My, my buddy Alan, who's an engineer, he says that he thinks that also drives your nymphs deeper, actually. That's something about the physics. Um, so experiment with your, with your presentations. Use different cider, cider angles on your leader to get different presentations. Every time you do it, every time you make a change, you're showing the fly a slightly different drift to the fish, you know, and that, that can make a difference. Another cool technique is called floating the cider. This works if you don't have real heavy flies on. You might wanna use a single fly or two flies that aren't too heavy. You might use a single like 2.5 millimeter, two millimeter, three millimeter, or pair of 2.5s. And if your cider is a little thicker, and again, that, you know, the trend for the more hardcore guys is to be going thinner on um, everything, including the leaders. The leader butts have gone from 15, 20 pounds. And we still start people out with, uh, we start people out like a 15 pound leader butt. If they're doing like, you know, building out their own leader, or doing a mono rig, and then we usually put a short transition piece, maybe a couple of feet long um, to maybe a 2X cider would be a, you know, maybe a piece of 0X between that and the 15 pound or, or something a little heavier. And a lot of guys though are going thinner and thinner and they're going, they're making their butt sections out of 10 pound, eight pound, even six pound. A lot of the comp guys are making their leader butts, believe it or not, out of four X cider material, even five, five and a half X, then just putting a tippet ring on it and then running a long piece of seven X, like seven, eight, nine feet, and then taking um, what you call cider wax. I don't know, it's almost like a, it's almost like a lipstick in neon colors that you put on your on a paint on your leader and it, it makes a, a cider you can wipe off. Um, and the advantage of that is you're taking all the weight out of your, your system between your rod tip and your flies. So if you're fishing any distance away from you, the further you, you go away, the more sag you get, the more weight 
and it does several things. It puts you out of touch with your flies by creating a big bow. And as it creates that big bow, it pulls the flies back toward you and out of the drift. So you're not getting like a dead drift and your flies may not be where you want them to be. It is harder to cast. It does tend to tangle around your rod tip more. Uh, if you're starting out, I'd recommend starting with about a 15 pound butt section, work your way down over time. Once you feel pretty comfortable with that, then you can maybe drop down to 10. You know, that's like two jumps down. Um, I've been using six pound lately. And I'm gonna I'm gonna try, which is about two x in what I'm using, and I'm gonna try some four x. Um, we'll we'll see where I end up. Uh, the six pound wraps around my rod tip a lot more than the eight pound did. You know, the eight pound I was using was I think zero x, um, but I'm able to fish far away and get really long drifts. And it let, lets you use lighter flies because you don't need as much weight on the end of your line to resist the pullback from the leaders. So I was starting to talk about floating siders when I realized I hadn't talked about the um, changes in the leaders getting thinner. And uh, so when floating siders is something you would do, oh, there's a few different times and you might do it. You could do it when it's windy. You're actually laying your line out on the water and you're greasing your cider up. Um, you could do it to present smaller, lighter flies and shallower riffles when the fish are in ahead of a run and feeding on them. But it's another good little thing to have in your, your arsenal of tricks. Um, I'm seeing more guys do that now. You know, it's not just the old under your rod tip with the heavy flies tight line drift. It lets you fish further away, it lets you fish flatter, skinnier water like pool tail outs. You could even sight fish fish you'd spotted nymphing in shallower water. Doesn't work well for long drifts with heavier nymphs. Um, that's probably about it for the uh, latest and greatest and uh, kind of innovations in, in your own nymphing. There was a couple of um, questions uh, back a while. Um, there was, let's see. Uh, I'm going to Oh, from Joseph Mortaliti. Um, it was in the chat. Uh, it just says, hey, Tori, given the increased angular pressure on popular rivers, in addition to climate change, what are your thoughts on catch and release limits, not just keep limits? And then it says, I, I've heard this mentioned by people in the industry. So, um, yeah, I mean, boy, that's a, I guess that's a whole big, <laughs> probably emotionally loaded, lo loaded topic. Um, yeah, I, I've heard people argue for that. I mean, if let's say, let's say you're a comp guy and you can catch a hundred fish a day on a high density stream on, on a really good day, should you, <laughs> are you, are you limiting the success that other anglers are going to have? Yeah. I mean, Boy, that's a tough one. You know, I mean, it's one of those things where it's, I think, kind of an individual thing up to people. Um, I know as I've gotten older, I don't have to catch. I'm a better angler, but I don't have to catch as many trout to make me happy. Yeah. I've noticed. Um, and a lot of times I don't go out for a full day, even when I could. I, I may not go out for a full day. Um yeah, I mean, trout are getting pressured. I mean, and that, that's one of the problems. You go into a pool like Church Pool on a Farmington at five o'clock in May, Lord knows how many of those trout have been pricked, walked on, seen flies. Uh, yeah, and it, it, it certainly makes them harder to catch. Maybe, you know, all that pressure can, of course, lower the quality of the angling experience for, for other anglers. So, yeah, I don't, I don't really know how to answer that. I think it's kind of an individual thing, but you could certainly make the argument that if you're having a good day, maybe you might want to knock off early and leave a few for, or, or maybe walk out of a run when you're still banging them and you see it, you know, a guy or like a, like a kid, you know, you can see their green with envy, maybe give them your fly, you caught them on and stick them in the spot and, you know, do a good deed. Um, I don't know that there are any other questions specific. Um, there is, um, Kyle, I don't know if Kyle's still on, but uh, lots of high conditions this year. Curious on your beads for anchor flies when you're doing, you know, a two or three flies in, in, in higher water. I heard you say up to like even five mil, but. Yeah, for streamers, you, you tend to fish heavier beads. They're bulkier flies that aren't going to sink as fast. 
and you're you're often manipulating them and moving them. So you need to overweight them because you're you know you need to stay tight to them. You want to get them down and, and you're moving them. Uh, you know, typically I wouldn't go over four mil on my nymphs. I mean, I got I got a few bombs in there, like you know, size six stones with a four mil bead where I let it up the whole shank with thirty thousand lead. Um, that, and that would be about the heaviest I ever go on a, on a regular nymph. You know, a lot of times when the water's high, it's not uncommon that it pushes the fish off into edge out of the main current in the shallower water. Sometimes I'm fishing lighter flies than you know, I might actually be fishing two and a half, three mil beads. Now, that's not always the case. Sometimes they're sitting tight where they were, and now the water is deeper and faster. Yeah. And then, you know, then you're probably doing three and a half, four mil beads, and you may be using a heavier dropper with it too. You just want to use a heavy enough fly that you're occasionally taking the bottom. And, oh, you know, I didn't really talk about that. People have this idea that you're nymphing and nymphing in general, that you're dredging. You want to be on the bottom. You don't really want to be on the bottom. You want to be near the bottom you probably want to be three inches six inches off the bottom and hell when, when the fish are active you you might you might be okay being 12 or 18 inches off the bottom i mean trout are set up to feed at eye level and above not below them like a like a sucker or a carp so you don't want to be below the fish you talk to guys like devin olson and george daniels that are top at top of the game they're happy if they tick bottom once every four or five drifts in the winter cold water you might want to tick bottom, you know, once every drift or two. Um, but if you're to like tick, 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 tick during a drift, you are too heavy. And it took me years to realize that. And I, I catch more fish for going lighter and your strike detection is better because, you know, if you're only touching the bottom occasionally, then a lot of times when you feel the slightest thing or you see your, you see your leader hesitate, it's a fish. Anybody else have any questions? I mean, we can um, there's fire 20, them up. I'm ready. There's 20, 29 of us on here. So if you want to come off mute and ask a question, this now's the time to do it. Nope. <laughs> well, I, you know, on, on the on the theme of weight, I, I know that there are some people, and I know they started doing this back in uh, Colorado, um, even before I left, or U Utah before I left. And that is putting putting um you know, putting your, um, your flies, both your flies or all three of your flies on tags and then having split shot at the bottom of your leader and using that split shot to get down. drop shotting, drop shotting. I said, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I, you know, uh, it's a very effective technique. <laughs> it, it's kind of relying on the exact same principles to make your own thing effective, except, you know, your own thing, you're using a weighted fly as your split shot on the bottom um, but yeah, I got customers that do that. They don't want to tie up a box full of weighted nymphs in different weights. So instead they just either have, you know, honestly for drop shotting, you want your flies ideally unweighted or maybe some with, you know, brass beads right. on them because they're going to move better. There's no need to use heavy flies. So why not get more movement out of them? Use your shot to get down. Um, you want to put them on tag and droppers because that'll give you better movements and you'll, uh, it'll give you that tiny bit of controlled slack to just like the wet flies. It'll let the fish suck in the fly and it'll give the fly a little bit better movement than if you tie them in line. Cause when you're pulling it tight like that, your flies aren't going to have as good a movement as if they're on tag end droppers. Yeah. I, um, I got a, a, a bunch of Pat's unweighted Pat's rubber legs in a fly swap. And, you know, the only way I'm ever going to use them is, is with, you know, with a, with a drop shot. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it makes a lot of sense. Hey, Tori, it's Michael. Hey. I finally got here. Hey, um, do you ever fish midge nymphs in the Farmington in the wintertime? Yeah, you mean things like... like, like true like midges. True midges. Like, you know, little tiny like Chernobyls or little tiny like uh, zebra midges or stuff. with Because I've heard that in wintertime, that's a good thing to put as part of your rig, but... I don't really know how to fish them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of guys in the winter will fish under an indie because you're fishing a lot of deeper, slower water further away. Um, you could absolutely fish them in a Euro rig. I mean, if you can get close enough to it and there's, you know, there's enough current to keep your rig moving along, you could put them on as your, uh, as your top fly. 
Um, but yeah, absolutely. You know, 18s, 20s, 22s, various colors, you know, blacks, reds, olives. You can do all sorts of other colors too. Um, I'll, I'll sometimes fish like a size 18, give or take like a yellow midge larva, but I, I, I consider it more of a caddis larva. So one of the interesting things in a Farmington is we have a ton of black caddis. Black caddis larva are actually yellow. And even the adults are black. And then the winter caddis that we're known for in the winter that hatch in the mornings, which is an anomaly for a winter bug, the larva of those are kind of yellowy, ambery colored, and they're around that same size. And over the years, just flipping rocks and doing kick samples in the winter and early spring in various trout streams, I've seen a lot of like size 18, 20, 22 midges in like a dirty yellow color. So you're, you're covering like three bases there I, I like to do those with something translucent like uh like micro like hairline micro tubing you know the smallest size okay okay another question from jt came in here's a loaded question favorite hash to fish on the farmington isonychia that's an easy one it, you know it will start in a lower river sometime in june like mid-june maybe down to Collinsville, Unionville, and then it'll be up in the catch and release area, but probably July would be the big month. And then you'll see them sporadically right into the fall. July is the big month for the big ice. So those are like, uh, oh shit, probably averaging a 10, eights, tens, twelves. And they'll get smaller as you go through the summer. And then we'll get another blast of them where they, where they ramp up again, I'd say in October. And they'll average probably closer to a 14 in October, like a 12, 14, even down to a 16. Um, we have an unusually long ISO season. I mean, they'll, they'll even go into November until it gets truly cold. And by then they're like 14, 16s and they're, they get kind of olivey colored too, toward the, toward the end of it. You know, the, the ones in the summer are probably a little more brownish, you know, a little more traditional. Although the color can vary. Um, a lot of times you'll find if you flip an ISO over their belly, even though their back's brownish, you'll, you'll see their belly is kind of grayish, olive-ish uh brownish it'll have a mix of colors in it i've done very well on a parachute atoms in a pinch during iso time in fact some days it's outfished the specific iso patterns i've had and just like with anything else i like an emerger in that i mean my favorite iso pattern would be like a just zeland shuck whatever dubbing you like for body whatever hook size matches the bug in a in a in a dun colored rabbit's foot wing like as an emerger and JT follows up with if you're if you're head hunting a big fish and you you get it to eat but you don't land it, would you keep pressuring it or would you hold off and go back like the next day? So you 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 what you, you like like you stung it, you mean? Yeah, you you prick him and then and, and he gets and he gets away or, or yeah, I'd probably wait till till the next day, kind of let him yeah. let him forget about it. The <laughs> big fish usually you usually you nip them. That, that's usually the kiss of death for, you know, for that, for that evening or afternoon. Do you, well, ever, do you ever fish a dry dropper rig? Cause that's one of my favorites. I love fishing like a 14 elk hair caddis with some little nymph hanging off the back of it, two feet, maybe even three feet off the back of it. And I like fishing I, that in faster water. Yeah, I do, but not as much as I should. I probably fished them more in the past, but I do sometimes. Sometimes I'll snip off my top fly and put a dry on. Yeah. You know, like and, uh, that, and, and if, you can, you can run, you know, interesting you're enough. If you're using a Euro rig, you can, I mean, you can totally do it on a regular, obviously fly line and all that, but you can also, if you're Euro net thing, you can also just put, put your top one, you know, whatever distance tip that you want between them. Just make sure it's uh, something with some good flotation, like an elk hair or stimulator or some foam bodied fly. And then a, you know, a nymph that's not so heavy that it's going to sink it. And if you balance the bead size to the fly size. So if you got a 14 parachute atoms, you don't want a three and a half, four mil bead on. You probably want a 2.5 mil bead, maybe, you know, two, 2.5. And then you want to balance the two. And if you balance them, the weight of the bead will let you propel the dry fly on, on these thin ass leaders, 20, you know, 25, 30 feet away. Um, and if you go to a bigger dry fly with these thin, long Euro leaders, you're going to have to put a heavier, you might need to put a 3.5 mil one if you had a big chubby Chernobyl on to get it to turn over on that rig. Yeah. 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 I, I, I love like water, like pipeline is where that's, 
that's how I fish that nine times out of 10. I love that water there in the summer, you know, when the flows come down to a nice weightable level. Yeah. Sorry, I had a, a question. A nice presentation, by the way. Thank uh, you. You you spoken about the pressure of the uh, on the fish in the Farmington, um, uh, making some very big claims about um, about about that pressure. I was wondering if there's been any conversation about moving towards lighter rigs and and subsequently needing to play the fish longer as it relates to that pressure. Is is there been any discussion about the health of the fish? Um, I mean, I've certainly heard people bring up, bring up that topic. Um, and the Farmington of course is heavily pressured. A lot of the modern lighter rods, if you're talking specifically about like the Euro rods and the two and three weights, the butt sections on a lot of those rods are like four five, six weight rods on them. Um, and if, if you know how to play a fish, you, you can land them pretty quickly. I mean, having said that I've watched guys in church pull throwing little dries on 8x and 9x play an 18 inch fish for 15 minutes you know which is way 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 too long you know and you know even on the farmington sometimes in the summer those water temps can be creeping up on the boundaries of of where you want to be you know i mean this last summer because they ran so much water because we had like a foot of rain in july they blew all the cold water out and the next thing you know 68 degree water is coming out of the dam and then as it goes downstream on a warm day it's you know, getting warm and yeah, if guys are out there fishing size 24s on 8x tippet and playing trout for for 10 or 15 minutes, that's that's a problem. We try to educate people not not to go any lighter than they have to, and please play the fish quickly. And you know, we were even telling people not to fish for a while there this summer, which you know it hurt it hurt business, but it was it was the right thing to do. You can't really ethically tell people to go out when you know they're going to be fishing in water temps in the seventies. Hey Tor, do you yeah. what do you what do you? Um, I mean, I know nobody nobody has a crystal ball. Oh, you're although you're closest to anyone I know who might have a crystal ball. But what do you think the effects are going to be this year based on all that we went through with the Farmington last year with the you know, hotter water than we were than we were used to having, higher water than we were used to having, all of those things. How does that all, do you think, play into what we can expect as anglers this spring and going forward? It'll be interesting to see. I mean, I think by and large, nature's pretty resilient. I mean, we did have some, we did have some big water in, uh, in July, but I mean, geez, uh, I don't know, one of those epic, uh, floods we got like i don't know what it was 15 years ago I, I forget what it in unionville i think i think the river hit like 30,000 cfs or something it was something crazy like that and you know the the bugs still survived but i mean yeah extreme floods and extreme droughts are certainly tough on fish i you know i haven't fished the housatonic much in the last few years but i'm but I'm hearing that the, the, like the Hendrickson hatch there is, is really petered out. And I, you know, I would imagine, you know, we've had some really rough summers and just like summertime's rough on trout, it's rough on, it's rough on bugs. So, yeah, I mean, and, and, you know, it, it floods that happen at a certain time of year and it may, it may only affect, it might not affect anything or it might affect like one or two particular hatches where the bugs were in, a particularly vulnerable stage at that time of year. Like I know in wild trout streams, like here on the Farmington, February is probably the month that the fry emerge from the gravel, the brown trout fry. And I know that when fry emerge, if they have to deal with really heavy high water, a lot of them die, you know? So it'll be good if the water's not too high this, you know, this February and early March when they're emerging and they get to, you know, get a little bit bigger and kind of get their feet under them, so to speak. So is a tiny little brown trout jig streamer a good thing for March and or February and March? You know, I've always wanted to play around um, around this time of year with with some simple pattern to imitate that, and uh, honestly. It could well be. I mean, I don't know how long your window is. Your window is probably only a, you know, only a few weeks long, I would imagine. But yeah, if you tied something, maybe, I don't know, maybe an inch long, translucent, skinny, 
you maybe want to do some prominent little dark eyes on the front because I know the par and the little fry have very prominent eyes in relation and you probably maybe even right under the throat maybe want to maybe take like just a very partial strand of glow bug yarn and like fluorescent orange or steelhead orange make a little tiny throat of it to make a they'll have like a little yolk sack right when they first hatch and that that could be a little a key or or, or a trigger interesting I just have a question here. You started tonight off by talking about the over, um, the overplay onto these rivers. And it makes me think about, uh, first of all, thank you for a very passionate and a brilliant presentation. But I, have, I take on this position as the fish, the trout itself. And, and I also think of the mission statement of Trout Unlimited. And I think, are the fishermen becoming do we do we have a threat to these fish that at the same time that we act upon our passions that we have to be sensitive to what we're doing to this species and the health of the river uh, as much as anything else the erosion and everything that is occurring and I, I have some concern that uh, we are we doing enough um, are we educating other fishermen enough I've been in your store and I, I, I never want to leave when I'm there, but, um, <laughs> but, and I can't wait to hit the river again. But, um, you know, again, I'm going back to the mission statement of Trout Unlimited. Where do, are we doing enough to protect these fish under these circumstances? So sort of, are we loving the fish to death almost is kind of what you're. It's sort of, yes, I can feel that, yes. Yeah, well, that, 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 that's a good question. I don't know if there's a simple, simple answer to it um you know the fish if they had their choice i'm sure they'd rather not be caught you know of course in connecticut the majority of the trout fishing anglers are partaking in is very unnatural you know we're we're stocking invasive species in rivers where they where they can't survive but you know probably probably the majority of trout streams in connecticut are you could probably classify as marginal where come July and August, they're very low and, and very warm. And there probably wouldn't be any trout in them if they didn't stock them. And certainly things like climate change, global warming, development, and the groundwater withdrawal that goes with it, uh, paving roads and, and large parking lots next to trout stream. And then you get that, you know, that rapid surface water runoff during a rain event where it would normally percolate, you know, through the, through the, you know, grass and bushes and trees and be released slowly into the water and have a chance to cool down. We, you know, certainly, um, we certainly need to look at ways of mitigating what we're doing. I mean, I think now, it, I think there is some legislation in place that makes it a little harder to uh, do development right on the edge of a trout stream, you know, kind of create buffer zones but I mean there's there's certainly lots of places where you know people have mowed their lawn right up to the right up to the stream cut down the trees so they can see the stream you know farmers that have their fields plowed right up to the river you know there's no there's no little riparian buffer zone not even five or ten feet um so yeah it would be nice to see some you know as much habitat stuff I mean I know that's one of the things you know, it's all about habitat. If you don't have the habitat, you're certainly not going to have the fish. And if you can restore the habitat, sometimes you can get a wild trout population going, albeit it might be with the invasive brown trout that's more tolerant of warm water than, than our native brook trout is. So it's a good question. Yeah. And it's, it's a, it's a big topic and, and there's no simple answer to it, but we probably need to do more. Honestly. Yeah. I think we could be doing more more habitat respiration, more planting of trees, more working on legislation to protect the streams, improve them. Um, I mean, one of the biggest things I've seen, I'm 56 since I was a kid, a lot of the streams I see just don't have the water in them they used to. And I can totally tie it in almost 100% to upstream development, just lots of residential developments, you know, condos, apartments, stores, and they're just, they're just sucking these streams dry. You know, the Mill River in Hamden is a decent trout stream, but it's not the trout stream it was when I was a little kid. And it's not even the trout, and even compared when I was a little kid, it's not the trout stream it was in the 50s when there was less development. I know I worked at Mill River Fly Shop and Gabe was the proprietor of it at the time and he's since passed away, but it, 
you know, he told me he thought in the fifties and sixties, that was maybe the best small stream in Connecticut. And the, at, I think when I started working for him in my early twenties, he said that some, the water company had something like, in my day, this is 30 plus years ago, they had something like 25 or 30 major wells on the aquifer for that river, because it's, I think, partly spring fed. So a lot of that water, there's been so much development in Hamden and Cheshire. It's just getting, it's just getting sucked out of there. That river gets very low in the summer. You know, fortunately it's shaded. So some trout do, do hold over, but it could be a lot better stream if they weren't sucking all the water out of it. Thank you. I think, I think, Tori, if you look at some of the information that's on the Connecticut DEP website, and they just did uh, they just did a thing about their recent brook trout habitat that I was looking at. And I was looking at the numbers from, I think it was 2008 to now. And they showed two columns side by side and streams that had, you know, 400 brook trout per mile in 2008 now have like three or zero or 10. And it was just so disheartening to look at the numbers because it just shows how, you know, how much damage has been done over the last decade plus. And, you know, yeah, we're trout unlimited and we do what we can wherever we can, but I don't know in my lifetime if we're ever going to bring any, bring those numbers back to something reasonable. I don't yeah, know I mean, in my, my kid's lifetime if we'll bring those numbers back. And there's a lot of smoking guns there. I mean, I think that probably the single biggest one is probably development, you know, kind of urban sprawl, suburban sprawl is probably the, probably the number one and all the evils that go along with it, you know, part paid parking lot, sucking the water out, you know, the, these streams being dewatered by water withdrawal, I don't think gets talked about enough. You know, it's one mm -hmm. of the biggest things I see in areas where, you know, trout, good trout streams are cohabitating with humans, you know, in rural areas, it's not, not as much of a problem. But, uh, and I don't know what the answer is because people need water and, you know, they're going to suck the water out of those streams, much as it <laughs> sucks. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know what? It's interesting. Vermont, they surveyed their brook trout streams in the 60s and they resurveyed them within the last five or 10 years. What do you think they found? Say that again. Vermont surveyed their brook trout streams in the 60s. And then they recently, like, I don't know, it might have been five years ago, within the last 10 years, I think closer to five years, they resurveyed them again. What do you think they found in a nutshell? Lower numbers. Identical numbers. Really? Yeah. But Vermont has, you know, I mean, what's the population of Vermont? Vermont's, you know, way bigger than Connecticut. It's like, was it like 700,000 people? You know, it's a relatively undeveloped, sparsely populated state other than, a, you know, other than a few major cities. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so to me, that's it's, I mean, they're dealing with climate change there, too, but they don't have the, all the development. So to me that, you know, I think development. Is the biggest smoking gun and all that. I think it's a cheap shot that I'm going to take now, but uh... I'd be interested to see what happens after the, the migration from COVID regarding the development that's going to occur that, that is going on in Vermont now. Yeah, I mean, I, I the people just spilled out of New York. I remember when uh, when the shit hit the fan, you know, we had to we had to operate the store basically with the doors locked for, for about two months. And man, all the New York plates you saw and you know, spilling, spilling out of New York, friends of mine in Great Barrington, Mass, they said just New York plates everywhere, Southern Vermont, just everybody just in New York wanted to get the hell out of Dodge. And, you know, I mean, and look what it's done with real estate. I mean, <laughs> real estate is going way up. People are, you know, you'll get 10, 15, 20 people sometimes, but you've got people buying houses sight unseen for 10, 20% over the asking price in some cases. It's, it's crazy, you know? It is starting to, it's starting to tame a little bit. It's still there. The numbers are still high, but it's not like the, it's not like it was a year ago. A year ago, you're right. People would send people out and say, go find me a house. Here's what, here's how much I'll spend. Oh, I have to spend an extra 30 grand. I'll do it. It was crazy. Yeah. Very, very much so. You know, there's a lot of people in New York that are, you know, that have high paying jobs and they've got the money where they can afford to spend whatever it takes to get get them out you know i think a lot of people have realized it's 
I think this has been a real reality check for a lot of people that, hey, maybe it's not about uh, living in the city, living the high life and, uh, you know, living in a sardine can. You know, maybe maybe there's something to this simpler life and getting out a little more in the country and breathing the fresh air and, you know, hiking in mountains and, you know, swimming in a lake and fishing in a river and, you know, getting out of the rat race. Mm -hmm. I think it's been a real reality check for people. And uh, I think a lot of people, they like it. Yeah. Tori, you're bringing, bringing me back to an earlier thought I had when you were talking about the increase of people fishing. Do you know of any, um, any data regarding uh, if we're getting more, more funding from Dingle Johnson because of that, or is it too premature? I don't know anything about that. I wouldn't be the right guy to ask on that. But I mean, I know the Farmington, I know they've, they've measured the pressure and I don't, I don't remember what the exact numbers were, but I, I want to say it was the highest measured pressure in the Northeast United States. You know, I mean, there's plenty of other rivers in every state, you know, that where you may get a month or two where the pressure is exceedingly heavy. But the difference on a Farmington is, is man, I mean, those fish just, I mean, they get a little bit of a break in the winter, but not really. I mean, you know, the, the pressure is just crazy. I mean, they'll start stocking that river again. Oh, probably, you know, probably by mid February. Um, and of course, as soon as, as soon as people know they're stocking it, they come running. <laughs> That's a whole nother topic. I could talk about that for a while. All the stock trout tracers. Do you think that the, that the Farmington, Farmington still needs to be stocked, Tori? There's a decent population of wild trout in the river. Um, I don't know what the last st statistic was, the percentage. I, in the catch and release here, I think they put it at a, at a fairly higher percentage than you would have thought. Now, remember, though, they're also counting trout, you know, like yep. three, four inches long. And a lot, of the, a lot of the wild trout, you know, when they talk about it being like, you know, 35 or 40 percent, a lot of these fish are, you know, like three to six inches. Um, cause people, cause people are like, oh, well, I'm not, you know, I'm only seeing like one out of 20, but you know, they're talking about maybe, maybe, maybe bigger trout. Um, given the current set of circumstances with the current fishing and the current regulations, yeah, it, it, it still needs to be stocked. You would have to totally revamp things. Um, you mean, my guess would be if you stop stocking the river, the trout wouldn't go bye-bye, but you'd have a lot less trout per mile. You'd have a lot of unhappy anglers grumbling that they fished for four hours and didn't catch any fish or they caught one, you know, six inch wild trout. Um, and, you know, if you were still letting people keep fish the way you are on most of the river at certain times of the year, I think a lot of the fish would get taken out. You would have to, you would definitely have to make a catch and release on brown trout all year. Um, I do know that a lot of the successful spawning that takes place is those two-year-old trout they put in in the spring, you know? Those are big trout. And, um, you know, I don't pest their spawning trout, but, you know, 15, 20 years ago, you know, most people didn't think anything about going in and fishing where the fish were spawning. And I remember, you know, the majority of the fish we get were those two-year-olds. And they were like 16, 17, 18, 19 inches. And they were spawning like crazy. So, I mean, I think, and you know, the progeny of those would be considered wild trout. So, I mean, you would definitely be reducing the number of, you know, trout that were spawning. So you'd have a reduced number of trout. So yeah, I mean, who knows? Hard to say what would happen, but, you know, given the current circumstance with the current level of angling pressure, angler expectations of catch rate, um, and the way the regulations are written, you know, they, there would have to be a lot of changes. And uh, I suspect you'd end up with, you know, maybe 500 trout per mile instead of 3,000 or maybe 1,000. And these would be wild trout that would be hard to catch. You, know, you might end up with something more like the Delaware, but with maybe like a, like a, like a lower trout count per mile. I think some of us here would would sign on for that though i'm sure some people would i'm sure some people would some people would be very disappointed other people would be happy it's a hard you know it's the kind of question if you ask the biologists 
they may have an opinion, but I don't know if they're going to tell you exactly what they think because <laughs> they have to be very uh, diplomatic in what they say. I'm sure that's true. I mean, I can tell you this, there are more wild trout in the river than, than the average person realizes. I've still got a few customers who don't think that any of the trout in the river are wild. Really? Mm-hmm. Would you consider them educated anglers? I mean, one, one particular gentleman is extremely smart. He, he just finds it hard to believe that there could be any wild trout because of the intense pressure, the people walking on the river, you know, fishing during spawning, you know, that, that just, but uh, there's lots of wild trout streams with thousands of trout per mile that are heavily pressured. So, I mean, I don't find it hard to believe at all. I mean, I know what they stock and I know what I catch and some of the trout or, you know, I mean, the only, you know, the only complicating factor, you got this going on on the Houstonic, you have this going on the Farmington. A lot of those tributaries get seeded with fingerling and fry. I mean, you know, fingerling are like the length of your finger and fry are smaller than that. So if a fish like that works its way down into the Houstonic or Farmington, makes it to 12 inches, eight inches, whatever, it's going to look like a wild fish quite likely because it, you know, typically stock trout have fin damage. That, that's usually how I tell. I look at their dorsals would be the most telling fin. The dorsal will be, the rays will be bent or it'll be damaged. It'll be thickened too. Like a, if you look at a wild trout, you go to a stream where virtually all the trout are wild. Their, their fins are usually very flexible, thin and transparent. In a lot of cases, you could slap their dorsal fin over a magazine page and read the print through their dorsal fin. They usually have large, well-formed, nicely shaped pectorals. They don't have nubby pecs. They usually have big tails on them. They don't have flat spots on their tails. So they'll sometimes, you know, sometimes various animals take a bite out of their tail or during spawning, you know, the females can get flat spots on their tails from digging. But, uh, so, so that would be the confounding variable, you know, and when the biologists shock the fish, if they get, if they get fish like that, if they look wild, they're going to count them as wild. So, you know, that may inflate wild trout numbers, I'm sure. I mean, the only way you could tell, you'd have to take a scale sample I, I, and look at it under a microscope. That, that's yeah. the, def and they do that sometimes. That, that's the definitive way. I know, I know toward the tail end when I was managing the store on the Farmington, I remember the next to last year I was there, they shocked two 20 inch wild rainbows which was a surprise to me. And they were only three and a half years old. And I'm like, are you sure they were wild? And he's like, yep, we, we took scale samples. We looked under a microscope and they were only three and a half years old. You're saying that was the Housatonic? Housatonic. Okay. Believe it or not, there's, you know, there's, there's, there's hardly any rainbow trout spawning in the Farmington. I've caught a handful. I know Zach, Zach, you know, guys there, he'll get them occasionally. Derek will get them occasionally, but the biologists say there's very little, very, 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 very little rainbow trout spawning. They, the only ones I've caught have been up in Riverton, although I know I got friends that have caught them here and there. And we've caught like little four inch ones with like par marks on them that look like something out of the Delaware. The, the Housatonic actually does get some rainbow trout spawning in the, in the tributaries. I don't know why, you know, I don't know why we don't on the Farmington. You would think we'd get some because certainly the brown trout do well. Mm -hmm. We have some wild brook trout, which I suspect come from the, I think they move in and out of the tributaries. Cause I, I tend to catch, I'll get like four to eight inch wild brook trout more so in the summer, early fall when the water, you know, when it's hot and low water, they drop down out of these little brooks that are half dry to get into the cool water in the Farmington. And then they migrate back up them in the fall to spawn. Pretty much. I tell people, if you get a 12 inch brook trout in the Farmington, it was stocked. <laughs> <laughs> and they stock the last couple of years they stocked a lot of like 12 to 15 inch brook trout so would you say in your very uh respected opinion is the farmington in good shape or is it in in not so good shape or is it in trouble farmington is absolutely unequivocally in good shape okay cool could there be improvements Maybe. 
But even if nothing changed and we stayed status quo, I think most people would, you know, give it a pretty good rating. You know, could, could we get the wild trout population higher? Maybe. I don't know. I mean, you know, guys like guys like yourself and myself, we'd probably like to see the whole upper 21 miles catch and release. Wouldn't bother me. Or, you know, I mean, there's a lot of guys that come to the Farmington that want to keep trout. Um, you know, and maybe if you wanted to increase the catch and release, maybe you make that upper 21 miles catch and release for brown trout, but you let people keep rainbow trout. I mean, I don't know. There's there's a lot of <laughs> you got a hitchhiker dude yeah i got a hitchhiker <laughs> what about uh, repairs up on the on the dams are that's that going to adversely affect the uh the farmington as we go along i don't think so i mean during that during that time period in july when the flow was crazy so they were they were running the water through the spillway which they haven't actually, they haven't run water through the spillway in several years that I can recall. And they actually got to do, um, check the dam out. And I think it'd do some maintenance on it. Cause that all got, I don't know how many years ago. I mean, when I was a kid, they weren't generating power there. They were just letting water out. And then when, you know, we get a good slug, it would come over the spillway and they were, they were generating power in Colebrook, but those turbines, there are like old and, so now they're, they just run the water out of Colebrook and they generate power out of Hogback now. Or at least that's what I was told. Hopefully mm -hmm. I have that correct. Interesting. Okay. Yep. I'm up for more questions if you guys got them. I got a question. Yeah, I knew you would. When are you going to take me fishing? <laughs> <laughs> well, geez, I live right on the river now. You know, I got a, you know, me and Mandy got a place here and uh, we moved in in October. So I can literally, I'm, I'm near the shop. I'm in New Hartford. I can literally walk out my back door to the river. That's awesome. Which, I mean, right where I am, I'm right on, you know, like a fast riffle section, but, uh, not exactly winter water, but uh, yeah, but pretty soon I'll be able to literally fish right behind my house. I mean, if I can, I, you know, if I want, I can just walk downstream from my house and, and fish, you know. It's awesome. Yeah, no, it's pretty cool. You know, when the, when the weather's nice, you know, you can, you can hear the river when you got the, you know, windows open. Got a, got a deck and a balcony overlooking the river. It's pretty cool. Congratulations, dude. That's awesome. Thank you. I, 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 I finally feel like an adult now at age 56. <laughs> you know, sometimes being an adult is okay and other times it sucks. <laughs> oh, believe me, I'm still, uh, I'm still a big kid. Ask anybody that knows me. Yeah. Oh, Mark, you're muted. You think I know how to run Zoom now? You know? <laughs> um, so this is, yeah, I got this recorded. So I'll put it up on our YouTube chan channel and then put a link on our uh, on our website, Facebook page. Cool. All right. Cool, that was fun. Well done, Tori. Hey, Thank Tori, you. I need you to do me one favor, though. I need you to send me your address. Yeah. We'll do. Text it to me, please. We'll do, sir. And um, I'm out of commission until the beginning of March, but I'll see you. I'll see you in the shop when I get back on the river. I'll be there. Wear something cute. And I want to say thank you very much for a great presentation. Oh, yeah. my pleasure. It was fun. Thank you. Bravo. Thank you. All right, folks. I'm going to stop the recording, and then uh, once I end the meeting, you all get kicked out. So. Okay. Have a good evening. Thanks, right, everybody. Thanks, thanks Tori. Well. See Thank you later. You. Bye, guys.